Coming up, the second Arab awakening. It's so simple, this call for pluralism in the Middle East, that you think it should be self-evident. And yet it is not. Former Jordanian Foreign Minister Marwan Mouasher argues for pluralism and democracy in the Arab world. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Our speaker is Marwan Mouasher, a seasoned diplomat whose career has spanned the areas of diplomacy, development, civil society, and communication. Currently, he is Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he oversees research in Washington and Beirut on the Middle East. He will be discussing his most recent book entitled The Second Arab Awakening and the Battle for Pluralism. This book has a very simple mes message, you know, The Second Arab Awakening and the Battle to Pluralism. It's so simple, this call for pluralism in the Middle East, that you think it should be self-evident. And yet it is not. In the Arab uprisings that have started, and are still ongoing three years later, the word pluralism does not appear anywhere in the lexicon of those who have uh, revolted against old regimes. Uh, we've, we've heard about social justice, uh, dignity, but no one yet is talking seriously about a process that would put in place the foundations for a democratic, for a pluralistic system that would be sustained, stable, and prosperous. I call it the second Arab awakening because, of course, there was a first Arab awakening, an intellectual movement that started in the maybe mid-19th century by intellectuals in many places in the Arab world that today are witnessing the same turmoils in Lebanon, in Syria, in Egypt, in Tunisia. And that movement, which was calling for the Arab world to get rid both first of Ottoman rule, then of colonial rule, later found its way into popular movements all across the Arab world that uh, called for independence and in the end was, were successful in achieving it. The second Arab awakening started as popular movements around the Arab world. These movements have not yet been contextualized, if you will, into any kind of an intellectual framework so that today we know more about what the movements were against than what they are for. Nobody yet has done that in a very convincing manner. And therefore, what we have seen so far with the Second Arab Awakening, in contrast with the first, which was a battle for independence that stopped there, the First Arab Awakening main shortcoming, in my opinion, is that it has battled for independence against despotic rule and then stopped there. Once independence was achieved, no Arab government, secular or, well, they were not religious then, no Arab government, progressive or conservative, truly gave pluralism and democracy any attention. No effort was done to build and put in place the foundations for true democracy. And that is basically the message of the Second Arab Awakening. If the Second Arab Awakening is to be successful, it cannot just be a movement against despotic rule. It also has to be a movement for pluralism. Pluralism, in my opinion, must be the operating system that would help lay the foundations for a prosperous <clears throat> and inclusive Arab society. My departure point, of course, is that the status quo was not sustainable in the Arab world. We did not have natural stability in the Arab world. That stability was artificially induced by autocratic governments that basically had a lid on you know, society's uh, aspirations for democracy and pluralistic rule. Once that lid was lifted, it is natural in the course of three short years, it is natural to see what we are seeing today. And therefore, I think there is no movement in history, no transformational process that took place in you know, a short three years. Uh, we tend to forget that countries like Germany were a dictatorship until 1945. 
Spain and Portugal did not achieve democracy until the late 70s, early 80s. Countries of Eastern Europe did not achieve democracy, some of them probably not until today, until 89. And the list goes on. No one should expect in a region that did not experience a culture of democracy, no one should expect such democracy to really uh, uh, emerge in the course of sh three short years. So I would, my first message is to exercise patience. People were too fast to call it an Arab Spring three years ago, and people are too fast today to call it an Arab Inferno or an Arab Winter. We are still witnessing the first page in a very long book along the way to democracy. What concerns me most negatively at this stage is that so far, in many countries of, uh, that have undergone transitions, it is still a zero-sum game between the secular and the religious elements. Both forces are, uh, in some countries, not all, particularly in Egypt, Secular and religious forces are engaged in a winner-take-all battle, where if the religious forces come to power, they behave in an exclusionist manner, as they have done in Egypt last year with the development of a constitution that did not enjoy consensus among all forces in society. But we are also seeing secular forces, once they come to power, ex you know, engage in the same exclusionist uh, uh, policies that they accused the Islamists of doing uh, before them. And so far as the battle in the Arab world is seen as a battle between secular and religious elements, so far as it is seen as a zero-sum game, the sum will be zero, in my view. If both forces do not work maybe not together, but at least work for the development of a pluralistic society in which they push for the right for themselves to operate, but for others to operate as well. Unless they are able to do so, they will stay engaged in an exclusionist discourse. And what we will see is the replacement of one dictator or one set of dictators by another and no more than that. There is a notable exception that no one talks about in the Arab world today, that in my view uh, has the potential of being a model that uh, many other countries can use on their way to uh, a smooth uh, transition to democracy, and that is Tunisia. Tunisia today has not been engaged in the same kind of exclusionist policies that we have seen uh, among other Arab countries in the region. They have uh, had a coalition government for the last three years in which no, you know, even if the Islamists won a plurality, they did not rule alone and were engaged in, uh, with others in uh, governing the country and no interference by the army. That is a model, in my view, uh, that holds a lot of promise for the rest of the Arab world. If elections are held in Tunisia today, the Islamists will lose to a coalition of secular forces. It does not mean that they will vanish, but it will mean that they will lose their plurality that they enjoyed over the last three years. And it would be the first time in the Arab world of an Islamist government coming to power and leaving by the ballot box not through military intervention. And that is going to send huge waves across the Arab world, particularly in countries that have not undergone transition and have been preaching you know, that if the Islamists come to power, they will never leave, and therefore they are the be better of, or the lesser of two evils. The second uh, very important lesson that we can discern from the Arab awakenings that have uh, uh, took place so far, is the loss of holiness that the Islamists have enjoyed for the last 50 or 60 years. Arab governments have basically prevented Islamists from coming to power artificially, artificially have banned them in most of the Arab world. And as a result, when people were not satisfied 
with systems that did not have any you know, systems of checks and balances, the Islamists were the only protest vote they could go to. And the Islamists, on their hand, were able to promise many, you know, uh, many issues to, uh, the, to, to, to the general public without having to put these promises to the test because they were outside the system and did not have to prove what they were promising. In three short years, after the Islamists came to power in Egypt and Tunisia, the Islamists lost more support than Arab governments hoped they would through their exclusion uh, over the last 50 or 60 years. And today, Islam is the, is the solution, which was their popular slogan of Islamists. Today, it means far less, not just in Egypt, but across the Arab world than it has meant in the last 50 years. And that is my second point, and the book also talks about this because I show polls, particularly in Egypt, that show that even though the Egyptian public, and I would uh, claim the Arab public as well, is conservative and religious, the same public does not want its government to dictate to it how to be conservative and religious. The public wants its government to worry about the economy, basically. 70% of Egyptians want their government to worry about the economy. 2% want their government to wor worry about ideological issues. And that has been, of course, proved in Egypt when the same public that brought the Islamists to power two years ago went uh, to the street in large numbers to protest against their policies. If that is not a message for inclusion and pluralism, I don't know what is. And that is a message I think that also is extremely important uh, to the rest of the Arab world. Not everything, of course, you know, is rosy. Uh, one very uh, worrisome issue is the rise of sectarianism in the Arab world and sectarian politics, uh, particularly in the Mashraq, in the eastern part of the Arab world. In countries like Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, not yet Jordan, and I hope it stays away from it. These are all countries that were artificially created through the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916. But more importantly, since 1916, none of these countries put any energy in developing a true sense of, na of a national identity. Not a pan-Arab identity, but a Syrian identity, a Lebanese identity, an Iraqi identity that would trump all these sub-identities, whether they are ethnic or religious. And today, these countries are paying the price. Lebanon has paid the price multiple times over, Iraq is paying the price, and of course, Syria is paying it most horrifically because of that. That is less of a problem in the Maghreb. In Egypt, Egy Egyptians have thought of themselves as such a long time before their modern nation state was, was created. They are more homogeneous societies in Egypt, Tunisia, for example, than in the Mashrek, and that is why in my view, I think such countries have a better chance of making it, maybe after they go through, you know, few iterations in which forces will, as I said, attempt to rule exclusively and find out that that is not going to be a, a, a sustainable path towards uh, uh, prosperity and stability. But in a place like Egypt, it might take 10, 15 years. But in my view, after that period, uh, Egypt stands a very good chance of making it to a stable and prosperous society. That's not the case in Syria. I'm very worried about countries like Syria, where the sectarian issue uh, and radicalism uh, really uh, uh, has meant that uh, it might take uh, decades before you know, we arrive at a stable uh, and a prosperous uh, situation. The book talks about um, 
what the Arab world needs to develop, to move from awakening to pluralism. Because awakening in itself is incomplete, as the Arab world itself has found out with the first one. What does it mean to move from awakening to pluralism? And I talk about at least four elements that in my view are essential if we are to do that. Politically, the Arab world must work for power sharing and a peaceful rotation of power among all political forces. Any country, particularly those that have not undergone transition, cannot talk of, serious, of a serious political reform process if it does not include power sharing, if it does not include the strengthening of the judicial and legislative branches at the expense of the executive, so that we truly have a system of checks and balances where abuses can be institutionally addressed and where no power can really dominate, as is the case in the Arab world today. No power can dominate over any other. Economically, the most important move, in my view, in the Arab world is to do away with the rentier system that has governed, a rentier economy that has governed most of the Arab world. In oil-producing countries, a rentier system has meant that uh, you know, with money literally go, growing on the ground, productivity was killed. People do not have to work for, uh, uh, you know, for their uh, style of life and has meant a no taxation, no representation attitude. If we're not taxing you, don't hold us accountable. And in countries that are not oil producing but are receiving benefits from oil producing countries like my own, a semi-rentier system, it has also meant the development of rentier layers around the regime that have benefited uh, from this system. And instead of relying on a merit-based system, people, uh, 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 particularly the governing elite, have relied on these rentiers, on these rents coming from the outside. If the Arab world is to deal with its huge unemployment problem, with its huge youth bulge challenge, 70% of the Arab world, 70% are under 30 years of age. It has to find a new way, a merit-based merit system to create jobs for these people. Because productivity can never be increased unless you encourage creativity, innovation, uh, unless you provide people with the skills necessary to compete in today's marketplace. And from a society point of view, inclusion. Inclusion, diversity, has always meant or been a bad word in Arab culture. The Arab world is diverse. It's extremely diverse. It is ethnically diverse. It is religiously diverse. And yet no one really celebrates this diversity. So diversity has been suppressed in the Arab world, whether it was political, cultural, or religious, in place of you know, the common good. And what has, what, 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 it has meant is that people in Syria today think of themselves as Christians or Kurds or Alawites before they think of themselves as Syrian. And uh, it has meant that people in Bahrain also are engaged in sectarian uh, uh, fights, uh, etc. And unless we adopt a system where diversity is truly, truly celebrated as a strength rather than a weakness, the Arab world is not going to face some good times. And that brings me to my fourth point, education. The Arab world, if the Arab awakenings are to really mean uh, uh, stable societies, education and educational policies must be revisited in the Arab world. Not in terms of building more schools or in terms of even putting computers in them, but in terms of the values that are taught to the young generation. If a pluralistic culture is to emerge, it has to have a foundation that can only come through education, where people learn about tolerance, learn about accepting other points of view, learn about truths being 
relative and not absolute, learn about critical thinking, uh, 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 are taught how to question, how to research, how to communicate. None of these, I maintain, none of these is, are issues that are seriously addressed in the Arab world. And today, when people in the Arab world talk about education reform, most of that reform goes to building schools or to the quantity of education and very seldomly do anything about the quality of it. Thank you. Marwin, um, your conversation discussion of the Sykes-Picot countries, the countries that were created by European demographers, European chart makers, uh, and then your further discussion about we're watching the dismantling of countries like Iraq and Syria. And it's possible to imagine them being dismantled three ways, a Sunni part, a Shia part, and a Kurdish part. Is it your point of view that um, it is in our, by our, I mean the international community's interest, instability's interest, to maintain those European-drawn borders, to maintain Syria as it is right now, and create pluralism within it, to maintain Iraq, to maintain Lebanon? Or do you imagine different national boundaries? I think what is worse than Sykes-Picot is to try to dismantle it today. <laughs> because in dismantling it, you are going to create countries that are ethnically pure, religiously pure. And that, is, that runs totally against the message of this book. The message of this book is a call for pluralism and appreciation of diversity. And the Arab world, as I said, is an extremely diverse place. But the solution to that diversity is not through chopping off the Arab world into you know, uh, 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 Sunni and, and, and Christian and uh, Shiite enclaves uh, that are going to be engaged in wars for uh, you know, the foreseeable future. I think the uh, solution is to treat, uh, treat people as citizens in their countries, not as subjects, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or cultural background. And that is possible, and that has been done in many countries around the world, including in your own. Uh, but the solution is not to uh, uh, basically carve the Arab world even further. Many people argue that democracy uh, in the West was successful because of the Enlightenment, and then the Enlightenment was successful because of the Reformation and the, what followed the Reformation, an understanding that you have to live and let live with other se uh, sects. There's never been a Reformation in, in the Islamic world. Uh, to what extent do you think that that could be a serious problem in terms of trying to achieve the, 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 the pluralism that you've been talking about? Well, that is true. And that is why, I, I wouldn't say there has never been enlightenment. I think there were periods in Arab history, you know, in Spain, in the first uh, few, uh, maybe 100 years of the Islamic empire, Arab empire, where we have seen some enlightenment, not total enlightenment. But I do agree that uh, uh, we, the Arab world needs to be able to do so uh, before we arrive at uh, a stable societies. If the question implies that this is not possible with Islam. OK, I mean, that's the big elephant in the room. If the question implies that this is not possible with the presence of uh, Islam as a religion that, that some view you know, uh, is not conducive to pluralism, then I would strongly disagree. And I would disagree, one, because there are successful examples of countries that are uh, you know, more or less democratic in the Islamic world, in Turkey, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and two, because of Tunisia today. I cannot, you know, I cannot overstate the importance of Tunisia today, where a constitution, listen to this, a constitution that upholds the right of people not to believe at all in any religion is agreed to by the largest Islamic force in the country. So for those who say 
Islam is not compatible with democracy, I strongly disagree. What I think needs to happen is that regardless of Islam's or any Muslim's point of view, religious point of view regarding issues, regardless of that point of view, that has to be kept separate from individual as well as collective rights of all citizens. And Tunisia has proved that it is able to do so. And if they can do it, there's no reason why others cannot do it at the same time. This is not going to take place quickly or automatically. And the Arab world, I think, will go through, most of the Arab world, will go through decades before they arrive at what you are saying. My optimism. Uh, uh, comes from the fact that at least the, the battle has started. At least the chance to do so, the battle for pluralism has started. From independence until 2011, that battle was suppressed by brute force. That battle for ideas was suppressed, unfortunately, by secular government. Today, the battle is possible. And some will win it, some will lose it, and some will struggle. Once again, I have to thank you for being so thoughtful, so insightful, and always wonderful to have you here. Congratulations. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.